That is where my best friend Amy lives. And it's right down the street from me, but yet I can't see her. By thy mother's care of Living here is, in a lot of ways, so different. It can be confusing and overwhelming, and it can be difficult to get used to. It was so different. It was like a, a culture shock. Everything was just so holy. <laughs> you know, everyone smelled holy. It was like walking into another world. The young women coming in are very, very intelligent. And they're giving it all to God. We're Carmelites. We want to be radical in following Christ. Come, let us worship God, wonderful in his saints. We are what we call a contemplative apostolic order. And that means that we do follow the prayer and lifestyle of the contemplatives, but in an act of world and in an act of apostolate. The activities is taking care of the elderly, and also daycare centers for children. The nursing homes and the convents and the daycare centers are all connected to one, so we never have to leave the facility. I'm a postulant. December 7th, I'm going to enter the novitiate. I'll become a novice. I guess you could say I'm taking the first step of something that's going to last for the rest of my life. I am nervous. It's a big decision and it's a big step. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy this Spirit. This is a cross that Amy gave me right before she left. It's probably the most special thing that I have that she gave me. So. And when people always ask me, where did you get that? I say, my best friend that's a nun <laughs> and gave it to me. And they're like, what? Yeah. We have been best friends since third grade. It would be like every day I was at her house or every day she was at mine. And it really hit me after she was already gone, how severe it was going to be and the fact that we couldn't talk to each other. It's like she died. And my mouth will proclaim your praise. Whoa! You did the whole thing. Wow. I didn't realize it did that. The Feast of St. Cecilia is coming up. I'm going to update the website. Don't tell we're doing this illegally. This is just for private use. <laughs> Access denied. How come? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> She does all the websites, she does everything. We're What's just, wrong? Sometimes we it? just get kicked off of See, and this is why I don't like computers, because when you lose something, I don't know how to find it. Well, it's hooked. On the website, we have the vocation stories of some of the sisters, you know, how they made it to the convent, why they came here. <laughs> Sister Marcel used to be an ice skater. Some of the girls have found us through the website. That's not how we all got here. I entered right out of high school, and I guess I decided to come here. Um, I realized that uh, God was asking more of me. I realized that there was more to life than what is 
going on out in society. I just felt sort of incomplete. But there was that, ooh, that sort of horror <laughs> at what I was doing. And when she told me, you know, it's a little, kind of shocking, but a little surprising. Obviously, I figured that she'd be going to college. She went to a, one of the finest high schools in St. Louis, and she did extremely well. She had a 3.95 average out of four, and uh, she was the National Honor Society. But I, I'm supportive in, in what she's doing. She went in in December. By that point, we were already separated and divorced. Um, I had, I mean, that day was, was, was very difficult. We all drove over to the convent, and we got in there, we talked, some of the nuns came out, some of the other girls were there, and we just all kind of talked for a little while. And they said, well, we're gonna take Amy and put on her jumper, get her dress. And then we just hugged her and kissed her goodbye and walked away, and that was it. My heart broke in some ways, but I thought, well, you know, I can't just fall apart right here and just stand in the, you know, and scream at the top of my lungs. I came upon it from more of a courageous standpoint, like, oh, she's gonna sail around the world or something like that. She's only 18, and to think of somebody that young making a decision that big is very hard to believe. It's a huge deal. Now we're going to spiritual reading. Of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your divine love. O oh God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful. The spiritual life is so new to me, and if I don't realize what's happening to me. The first purpose of our congregation is that you become a saint. Your main job, your main duty, is your own sanctification. Particularly during your initial formation, which will, will be eight years. That is your main task. They want the possibility of being a saint, which they know is going to be demanding on them. And the more I demand of them, of them I find the more they respond. And I think that's one of our biggest problems, is we try too hard instead of, you know, it, it's that surrender to the Holy Spirit. It's, I absolutely can't do it. I am too weak. And, you know, if we can really understand our weakness, is work because I can accept, yeah, I'm raunchy and I'm terrible and I'm horrible. Seeking sensual pleasure will cause us to be very self-centered. Masturbation is always a sin. Always a sin. The whole point of the religious life is to begin to wean you away from those things, and then the Holy Spirit will, will help you with it. And he likes sinners. He really, really, really likes sinners, not just a little bit. He really likes them. That's good. Whoa. I'm sure there was, you know, there were some adjustments that, that she would have to make. For me, the hardest part of all of it was the very beginning. Ryan. I mean, I can't say that a day doesn't go by, that I don't think about her, you know, hourly. I didn't really have a desire to go into a convent and never see anyone again. I didn't want to be a nun in my first six months of college, you know, and so this, well, I wanted to be a kid for a while, you know, and have fun and be with friends and, you know, and then also, you know, you think about, you know, dating and getting married and having children and then careers. And I want to have an impact on the world. And I want to, you know, to be somebody. And I had all these dreams and all these aspirations that I wanted to do and to be. You know, to, like, I love acting. I love theater. And you don't really get much of that in the convent. The convent was like, you know, throwing your life away. But I still felt that tug. I knew it's something in me, you know. I just, I just, I knew it was God saying, I want this. I was so mad at it because I just, I, 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 I denied it for like six months. When she first entered, the hardest part was like living without my sister, you know, because she was my sister. Now she, she is um, like everybody's sister. 
She's the character. She, um, cause she is really wild. One time she cut a hole in the back of this kid's shirt. I think she like got suspended at grade school a couple of times, you know. We'd spent every day together and, and like we had the same friend, you know, we shared the same room, we shared the same clothes. We're twins, like we've done everything together our whole life. My whole childhood, I shared a bedroom and I shared and a little bit, I shared a, even a bed with my sister. And so I entered the convent and all of a sudden I had my own room, I had my own bed. And it was the weirdest thing. And my first night was like, wow, Tabitha's not here. <laughs> and it was kind of hard at first. You're thinking, oh yeah, she's going to go see how she likes it, you know, like maybe she won't stay. I have four sisters and five brothers. At first they were very, very upset about it and crushed and everybody, you know, they just were not happy with my decision at all. Especially my father, I would say, just did not want me here. Well, we lost a son. This is like cutting off an arm, you know. And then when she goes away, it's like cutting off another arm. You're hurt, you know, you think, well, you know, you're not going to see her again for a long time, you know, we're not used to that. You know, you think, me. Why has this happened to me? Why am I losing another child? They were so against it. Like, I would get letters and, you know, that you shouldn't be there. You're throwing your life away. So this goes all to the novitiate. If you would take this over there. Well, I write her a lot. The novice, postulants and novices get a lot of mail. At the beginning, I would get, you know, two or three in a day. And okay. Or, uh, and this is all your bills and stuff, sister, so you can take all of these with you. My father thought I was seeking attention. You know, just the things they would say would just really, you know, would just crush me. God bless. A number of times I cried over those letters. Um, uh, it was hard. I'm the director of the Carmelite Child Development Center. As a little girl, I did want to be a, a sister, and I wanted to be a religious, but then the desire went away when I turned 12 or 13 years old and, and um, realized that if I become a sister, that there's an awful lot of things that I can't do. So I did away with that idea and got involved with school activities. Um, I had a great desire to, to go into politics. I was like the young Republican and, and conservative and going to change the world. And I was going to be the first woman Secretary of State and I was going to change the world because I thought I was so holy because I prayed the rosary every day with my family. I went to Mass daily with my family. And all it took was somebody just like me to set the world straight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, help me to be good today and bring peace to the world. Amen. So when I realized that God was calling me to himself and that I couldn't say no, that I knew it was what he wanted, um, it was like my whole world just flipped upside down. She was all in tears and uh, we said, my, what's wrong, honey? And she said, well, she says, I have to be a nun. And it was an incredibly emotional, incredible emotional turmoil that went on within me and, and I was just like, no, 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 it can't be, it can't be. my heart out to enter the comet because I loved my family so much. The day comes for me to enter. My mom and my dad bring me here. The novice mistress takes me in, inside. I put on the jumper. I come back out and I'm like, yes, just, yeah, go away. Let me start my life. The idea of a daughter leaving, that hit my heart. I couldn't do it. To choose between Secretary of State or having a daughter as a Carmelite. There's no comparison. They were hurting inside. They were sad, leaving their only daughter. And they leave and go back. And I walked in my cell and just lost it. I mean, like that hysteria comes over you, and it's, I, you, you can't control the sobbing. And I would wake up in the morning. The shade would be drawn. There'd be a little bit of light underneath the shade, and the sink was off on the side. My, my dad used to wake me up every morning and I, and I would hear him coming down the steps. I didn't want to open my eyes even more because right at that moment I was home and I thought if I just think hard enough I'm back home and I'm back in my bed and everything's all normal and nothing's changed and then I, you know, then you'd realize, oh, and open up your eyes. 
sick and I wasn't home. When I got the call and, and I was the one who decided to go into religious life, it was a shock for the entire family. But I think I even shocked myself. I thought, why am I doing this? <laughs> oh, I just found one of me as a postulant. <laughs> who wants to live with a bunch of women? That was never my vision. That was never my dream or goal for myself. All I wanted was a motorcycle, a horse, and a convertible, and that was it. As a teenager, I was very rebellious. I did all kinds of things in school to get in trouble. I got expelled in high school three times for horrible things that I've done. We set explosions in the labs for things that kids would be put in jail today. I enjoyed smoking and drinking and partying and playing cards till all hours of the morning. I was dating a gentleman who said, you know, get it out of your system and come back. Oh, here it is. And I said, okay, I did not go back. That's me. Um, that's me now. <laughs> Even though our life is extremely simple, it's also a very tough life. One of the toughest things I think is, is the um, everyday schedule. Some people can become extremely overwhelmed. Well, I mean, our life can be pretty monotonous sometimes. <laughs> we have so many things to do. I mean, our, our day is so scheduled. Our work is supposed to be, you know, for the salvation of souls. We're supposed to keep that in mind as we work. And so there's not really any downtime, <laughs> really. It's from 5 to 9.30. We're doing stuff. Between uh, morning prayer and um, communion service and mass, I have about 10 minutes that I can do what I want with. So I'm reading The Divine Comedy by Dante. It's, it's fiction, but it's a very interesting commentary on what heaven and hell and purgatory might actually be like. So I'll just sit and read. Or sometimes I'll go up and clean myself. We call our bedrooms cells. The sister's cell is meant to be her private space where she can encounter God and pray and be alone with him. And so I guess the pictures are you know, supposed to help you to meditate and stay recollected and focused on God. In our cells, we have just crosses because it's supposed to remind us that in the religious life, we are supposed to be, in a sense, crucifying ourselves. All right. You have uh, your own sink, and each of the cells has their own sink. You get to take a shower twice a week, and that sounds gross at first. <laughs> when I first found out, I was kind of horrified. But um, two showers a week actually are quite enough because you can keep perfectly clean. It's not that I don't care about how I look, but I don't have a mirror in our cell. <laughs> we don't, don't really have a need for a mirror because we don't need to beautify ourselves. To see her now as a nun, it's kind of weird to look back on that and think that she could be where I am right now. Oh, Seeing all my friends and not being able to see her is really hard because I love all of them. That would be good. That would be perfect. Uh, we could all dress up, jazz down a little bit. We just go to dance clubs and bars and just have fun. Go in the closet in the top. In your bedroom? Yeah. So I liked clothes. I, I was always interested in fashion and styles and things, but I think that actually I don't really miss clothes because I don't miss the hassle of picking out clothes and making sure they fit and do they look good on me and all of these things, trying to stay in style, and it just becomes such a distraction. To be in style and to be in fashion is not my focus anymore. But <laughs> I love shoes. I guess I would, I would have to admit that there are external things about the world that I miss. Um, so do I want to be in the convent or do I want to be out in the world? I've been asking myself that question. What is it that she wants? Tell me what is it that she needs? Should she give about the brand new things that you just bought for me? Because you don't have no kids. And you know, 
but you have questions all the way from the beginning when you first enter you have questions about whether or not you want to stay. The hardest part about living in a convent would be no boys. Oh no. <laughs> she had boyfriends. I mean, every boyfriend she had, she did care about a lot, so I'm sure it was a definite emotional strain on her. Sister put me in the sewing room, and so I've been learning how to make different kinds of clothes. And, um, I'm working on Andrea's tunics for when she receives her habit, she has to have something to wear under it, and this is what she'll wear underneath. This goes directly under the habit, under the brown part. I'm a postulant. I, I'm not wearing a tunic right now. This is for the sisters who wear with the full habit. When a young woman is lived with us for a year, and it comes time for her to um, ask permission to receive the habit. Yes, it's really the first step in the commitment that I've made. Well, from a postulant to a novice, there's a huge difference. As a postulant, so you're just kind of looking around, and do I want this? I don't know. You know, but as a novice, it just kind of, like, you get the habit, and you get the veil, and you get a sister name, and it's kind of like, wow, I'm part of the family now. When I enter the novitiate, my religious name is going to be Sister Claudia. I don't know if my veils are made yet or not, actually. Our habit has quite a lot of meaning and symbolism for us. Well, every sister gets two of them. And our habit goes back centuries to the time of the Crusaders. It's one of them. That's very attractive. It's sort of a, a beacon out there that says, hello, heaven, heaven, you know, and things like that. If no one wants to be a sister if no one knows they're a sister. And if we're not in the habit, then no one's going to see the sign. I'll be wearing this on December, starting December 7th. That's when I'll receive the habit. <coughs> I am a little bit nervous. It's a big decision and it's a big step. You don't go into the novitiate thinking, well, I'm just going to try this out because um, you probably won't finish then because it can be very difficult. Novices are cloistered. What that means is that you cannot leave the convent. I'm a novice, a second year novice. We receive the veil and then that whole year we cannot leave. I can't even leave our garden outside. Uh, you want to see your family, which you don't see for two years during that whole time. And so that's kind of hard. So the novitiate, it's, it's a time of intense preparation, intense formation, that you're going to be a religious and stuff. And so you, it's a kind of stripping away of all your attachments to, like, to the world. And, I guess it's like we consider the novitiate as kind of the betrothal. You know, it's the betrothal to, to, to Christ. This is my new veil. I'll get it on the 8th. That's when I make my first profession. Um, it's uh, the profession of the three evangelical councils, or vows, which are poverty, chastity, and obedience. And I'll receive the black veil. You know, so it's... I don't know how I can do it, but it kind of hangs like that. See? I got to try it on once already, and I got to look in the mirror, and it, I think it looks much better than the white. <laughs> um, I'll be a full-fledged sister. <laughs> I look forward to it, and I'm scared of the exact same thing. Sometimes it just sort of hits you, this is forever. The whole novitiate really is as a preparation for December 8th, but then also a preparation for the whole rest of your life. The three vows um, kind of are an epitome of what the whole, the whole life is going to be. All of your life before this, this moment of the taking of the vows is kind of a preparation. It all comes up to that moment. Everything in your life is going to flow from that moment. Every bit of the rest of your life is going to flow from the moment when you take those vows on December 8th at that very moment. It's a big step. From the moment we walk in the door, we're preparing for this moment. Again, these three things may be happening during the moment. You have classes on the catechism and the scripture and the virtues and vows and what everything's about. So every, every moment of our day is focused on this, and this, this is where we're going. Chastity.
chastity can have a very negative connotation. I think in high school I dated a little bit, um, but it was nothing major. Like I was never like in love or anything like that. Like I was going to marry a boy or something. Chastity is is a freedom. It's a freedom to love more purely, more perfectly. And the three vows are how we bind ourselves to Him. He has drawn you to Himself. Poverty, um, in in the negative sense, is that I cannot use anything without asking permission for it. Um, like me and my brother would spend weekends at the mall. It's all we would do is shop for clothes. Oh, I love shoes. <laughs> But I love clothes, I love clothes and shoes. We can be so greedy. And poverty is to help us be free of greed so that I can, um, again, attach myself more completely to Christ. And then the third vow, obedience, which for some congrega congregations, that's the only vow they take because it encompasses everything. Part of obedience is I am not to determine anymore that I do this or do that, or where your cell's going to be. Those are not going to be choices that you make. Which people you're going to work with. What toothpaste I use. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's not the choice that you're going to make. And the superior is going to decide, this is how you're going to use your talents. I give my talents to God. It's not for me to determine. He decided he loves you. And that's the reason he chose to draw you to himself. The greatest happiness, the greatest joy is, is union with him. I often feel that we should invent a fourth vow when we take the vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and that's of being charitable and nice to everybody. Can you imagine, you know, having 27 young women, 27 women of all ages, all backgrounds, all living together? A bunch of women living together, that's a miracle in itself. But yes, there are little arguments. We, have, we don't have cat fights or anything like that. You know, there's certainly days where we may, may not talk to each other. Look, she looked at me so mean. You know, it's just, you know, why would she give me that look? You know, <laughs> you know. We had one retreat master tell us that in the world you always have two women fighting over a man. In the convent, we become so petty we fight over a broomstick. <laughs> We're all trying to be holy and trying to be virtuous. Look, you see your reflection in the window. You're dressed as a nun, and then you go and you be mean to someone. You know, I don't know. Everything is so holy, and I'm not. <laughs> you know. For me, obedience is the, is the hardest. You know, to have to listen to someone else, and you know, not that they tell me to do terrible things. I'm, I'm what they call the k kitchen mistress, and even if I don't like this job, that it's it's good because the church gave it to me to do. You know, and and just trusting another to know that they know what's best for me. They know better than I do. You know, from what God wants of me and things like that, and just to, to trust in that and to say, lead me, <laughs> it's rather hard, <laughs> especially if you think that you know all. <laughs> but I, I can see how society would think that chastity would be the hardest. Yeah, I thought the same thing would, before I entered. I thought, oh, that must be the most terrible, you know, the most one that's you know so hard and all that kind of stuff. But it's really, I mean, of course it's a hard vow. And of course it's, it's an essential vow. And I guess seeing my brothers get married and have children and all those kind of things, not easy, but I, but, I, but I don't look at it that way really actually because my vows are kind of like getting married, it's marrying God. <laughs> A life decision you could call it. <laughs> actually our whole first three years are our preparation for that day, that's the gift of yourself to God and His gift to you of Him. So it's a big step, a bit scary, but I think everyone must take that step and it's adulthood that you have to grow up and you have to make these decisions. There's a lot of sacrifice, you know. I tend to get upset with superiors and things if I don't like what they tell me to do. And I can't yell and scream at them and things like that. But, you know, I just sometimes just going outside really helps sometimes just to put everything in perspective. They can become frustrated. When I was young and in formation, and when I became really frustrated with the work that we were doing in the apostolate, I would go out and scream until I had no voice left. I would go and beat walls until my fists were swollen and the walls would crack. But I worked it out. When they first come in as postulants, the first three months, oh, even maybe the first six months, are the most difficult time. We have so much silence. They don't have radio, they don't have television, they don't have music. Um, and they have a lot of time to think. We're ringing the bell for prayer. 
And what happens is they get to know themselves. You have a lot of time to focus on yourself and to make yourself better, which can be painful and yucky too. It can be confusing and it can be embarrassing and it can be upsetting. You feel like you're getting nowhere and you feel, you just feel kind of lousy about yourself. From the beginning, when you first enter, you have questions about whether or not you want to stay. You have to deal with doubts about whether or not this is really what you want to do. I've had doubts. Do not despise thy children's cry. I had a couple of companions who left. And most of the other girls that I've talked so with to have, to have to deal with doubts. Dear, dear St. Joseph, lend an ear to thy children gathered here. There is the fear of failure, but fear is a tool of the devil. I mean, you're giving up a lot of things. You're giving up choosing your own career, you're giving up marriage, you're giving up having your own house and your own car and all of these things. You know, sometimes when you think about those things, you know, do I really want to give all that stuff up? The Eucharist, a taste of eternity in time. The Eucharist is not only food for us on our pilgrim way, but also the promise of what lies at our journey's end when we... I miss, I miss, the, I miss theater very much. The Eucharist as a foretaste of future glory. I want to go to heaven. <laughs> I, I want to be, I want to be a saint. Strengthen their souls with... Going to Hollywood wasn't going to get me to heaven. And pursue a greater guarantee of eternal happiness. I mean, I have doubted that. Am I Any supposed to be here or am I not supposed to be here? You know, I have doubted that. Excluded. I believe that God called me here and I believe that he loves me and I believe that, that, that he is out there. I know it. I know it. But I mean, he can't come down and say, I love you. <laughs> it's within that setting of searching for God that the Eucharist mm -hmm. can then achieve its end. Sometimes it's just kind of like, what is this all for? Is all this really real? You know? <laughs> When I went to go profess my final vows and I laid my hands, my superior's hands, and I said, I vow to the holy triune God forever, chastity, poverty, and obedience. Saint Joseph, you were It was a fulfillment of everything I wanted, and within three months, I was like, why in the world did I just do this? This is horrible. When you were given warning, of troubled days ahead, you yielded not to morning. I literally woke up one morning and just woke up in bed and was like, what is it all for? Why am I living this life? What in the world is it for? But trusted God instead. You have to have a sense of humor. Um, I think it was St. Teresa of Avila, the great doctor of the church who said, there is no such a thing as a sad saint. If you don't have a sense of humor, you, you shouldn't be in religious life. <laughs> we like to have fun and enjoy life. Amy told me that she's learned how to polka. And a lot of the times the nuns will break out into square dancing. <laughs> Ready for it? Uh, Sister Edith Marie, if you could run upstairs and get the scissors for hair cutting. They get their hair cuts before they get the veil, you know what? I am a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> about my hair cuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, not
out in the world, haircuts are no big deal. But here, it's just like, it, it's sort of saying, it's coming, you know, it's coming, it's just around the corner. Uh. It's such a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's haircut time. <laughs> I used to get my brother's haircuts. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Tied him well, to the chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's the beginning of the process of change. As a religious, what we do is we give up the vanities of the world. And for a woman particularly, one of her great vanities is her hair. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> she has this great love of her hair. <laughs> But we begin to try to um, get rid of our vanity. So it's always been tremendously symbolic of leaving the world behind when you cut your hair. Leaving the world, and that's what religious life is all about. You can hold on to that. She is going to become a new man through the whole process of change in the novitiate. Unfixable. <laughs> so this is the very beginning of it, the first stage of the transformation into Christ, to truly be a spouse of Christ. You have to begin changing. I leave behind those things of the world and enter the world of God. It seems like I'm throwing away my life. Oh, why do I have to do this? I think at first I was kind of excited. One of the first levels that you go through is the sort of, is the emotional experience of God. It's intensely emotional. He's wonderful. But then, sort of dread set in and I wasn't very happy about it at all. We humbly ask you to reveal the mystery of her life. Being a may sister isn't about the feelings of excitement and, you know, thrilling. Your whole life isn't going to be like that. May find the way to you. Amen. Free evening of recreation. It means that they can do whatever they want until 8 o'clock, and then they can go to bed. I am making a Christmas card for my parents, and Mary here is helping me. Um, Andrea just went on our home visit a couple months ago, and she brought pictures for us to look at of her family. Sister, it's your turn. After your posthumous, you get to go home for one week. It's been two years since I was a posthumous. <laughs> Leaving the convent for a whole week, well, the thought of it was a little frightening. <laughs> I was afraid of making those attachments again and just, you know, having to start all over. It was nice to have her home. When I walked in, I just... It was awesome. As soon as I saw her, we were both like, yay! It was really good to see her. We went to Six Flags with her mom and her brother, and we just rode rides all night long, and it was so much fun. It was kind of odd, though, because she wore her habit. So we were kind of getting looks from everybody, but it was okay. She seems to be very happy. I'm just very proud that she's making her decision. She told me she was going to do it. It's getting down to the wire. And the night before they, they do receive the white veil, we make them publicly in front of all of the sisters. They get down on their knees and they ask permission of the superior. Pray for the reception of novices into our congregation. May I have permission to enter the novitiate? Pray that God may increase their number and their piety. Amy was extremely nervous when she asked for this and she got real quivery with her voice. But I held her hands and she did have tears. I have butterflies. And today I'm going to enter the novitiate, I'll become a novice. And it's kind of hard to believe. Is everybody here now? It's a, it's a private ceremony, just with the community. Your family doesn't come. It's just the community. Peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of all our carnal spirit and joy be with us all. Let us all join in singing the first hymn. All for thee, O heart of Jesus. I miss her a lot. On Christmas morning, she used to usually wake me up. We'd still be in our pajamas, and then we'd get our presents, and it's just a fun time. She won't be coming back for Christmas. I cried about the idea that 
you know, I wasn't going to be seeing her, that I was going to miss her. But she's chosen to do what God has chosen for her to do. Put on the new man. Receive this religious habit and grow in humility and simplicity. Now I'm really making a step towards to saying, yes, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to stick with it no matter what. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. You will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wow, I'm actually going to wear this. What about me? Amy, you just were convicted for a murder. Where are you, what are you going to do? Go to jail. She was just a lot of fun. I'm a Just a fun child, a great personality. Strive for the purity of heart in preparation for your total surrender. Amy. Amy will be known in religious life as Sister Claudia, Sister Mary Cla M. Claudia. Andrea will be Sister Mary Raphael. And we now have two new novices. Eternally my heart will sing a new canticle of love. It's kind of like your betrothed. I mean, that's your betrothal. That's your, you're engaged to God. <laughs> I didn't really, I don't think I really thought this day was ever going to come. And it's you and I'm happy. I'm very happy. <laughs> My head's a little itchy, uh, <laughs> but I'm especially happy. Sister Mary Xavier came up to me yesterday and asked permission to profess her vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. She also was shaking very hard. Tomorrow, I'm going to make profession, although what we call a junior professed sister. <laughs> we just had silent retreat for the past week, and like the first three nights of the retreat, I could not sleep a wink because <laughs> I was just laying there. As soon as this is over, <sighs> that's the day. <sighs> that's a big step. <laughs> you got butterfly through, are you still shaking? <laughs> Father Joe Weber's here too. Look oh, at that. Hi, Father Weber. Look at she just got off of retreat. Can you Father, imagine this? Tomorrow it's going to be gone. I know. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Isn't that something? <laughs> From our youth group. Uh, From the youth group. Are they coming? Some of them are. Oh, that's great. That's great. Just for the mass. Does she look holier now that she's off retreat and stopped shaking? She was shaking so bad yesterday. I don't yesterday. know if Sister Mary Xavier looks holier or not. Oh, <laughs> you're terrible. I've known you too long. Don't yes, forget. he knows the real you. Uh, yeah. All right. She's all right. nervous. Yeah. Well, I just butterflies. It's you got to kneel down, put your hands You think I'm not nervous? That's it, no. you're nervous. <laughs> no, hold on. I'll take a shot of whiskey before that. <laughs> oh, Jack Daniels just... Jack Daniels okay. a All right. And we're going to go for prayers now. We'll remember you in prayer. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say yes to God. This is my whole life here. It's such a scary thing. But when we make our vows, it's, it's our wedding day, and it's where we say yes to Him completely. It's like, wait a second. I always had, like, you know, like, oh, we were going to get married together. We're twins. She's a great sister. We've never done anything without each other. But I'm gonna be married before her. Gladness for bridegroom and for bride. The Lamb's great feast is ready. His bride is at his side. I should see all the bridesmaids. <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm gonna say it and become his. We begin, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you.
my family. Are they here? Ah, did they come? Did they come? And you want your, your parents to be happy with what you choose to do in life. And they were so against. In our ceremony this morning, Sister Mary Xavier, after making her profession, she belongs completely to God and is totally devoted to Him, chosen by the Lord who wished to accomplish in her the mystery of the I'm Incarnation. I'm nervous for her. She reminds She's like scared or whatever. Persons. Sister Mary Xavier of the Divine Bridegroom, are you resolved to be more closely united to God by the new bond of religious profession. I am so resolved. You resolve to live in chastity as a sign of the kingdom of heaven, to practice voluntary poverty, to offer the sacrifice of obedience. I am so resolved. May Almighty God give you his grace to fulfill your resolution. If all my hands are shaking, I hope I can get through this. Hi. Hi. Is it going to come out? Is it going to come out? Hi, Sister Mary Xavier of the Divine Bridegroom, Tiffany Irene McCullough. With the firm determination of consecrating myself totally to Him, with my whole heart I join this religious congregation in the service of God and the Church. By the authority entrusted to me, I accept your vows. Sister Mary Xavier, receive this veil by which you are to show that you are totally given to Christ the Lord and dedicated to the service of the church. Receive, dear, dear sister, the light of Christ as a sign of your immortality. Christ will be your life. This is really magic stuff. I lose the daughter could gain the son, you know. I see a person that's so happy and so full of life and love. I could never imagine someone being so happy, never in my wildest imagination. But being at this moment, I just can't see anything else. I first saw her, she looked so cute. She was my daughter, Amy. I'm happy for her. <laughs> it's so weird to call her Sister Mary Xavier. She's like a part of me, so it's like kind of like this part of me is like becoming a nun. Maybe I should become a nun, yeah. My family, they were thrilled and they were just so happy for me and it was just, it took me so much peace. Just, they are happy with me and this is great. <laughs> They changed, they changed the, uh, they changed the veil, like, right in front of everybody. You couldn't see a thing. Can I, can I see it? Are you allowed to take it off? Uh, right now. Oh, let me see it. Look, when am I going to see it? Oh, well, never, never. Yeah, let me see it. Why? You're not allowed to? Sister Mary, you're me. You're not really a sister. You are. So you know how to poke now, don't you? Prepare me for the road down the road. I'm going away. I'm leaving today. I'm going away. I think I'm living my life the best, the fullest way that I could. But I would rather just give up now than to be a, a lousy sister. No matter what happens, she'll always be a part of my life. She's still the same person. Um, she just wears a veil now. People sometimes will say to those of us who are very religious, oh, you don't know what the real world is like. So which one is more real, the things that you can see 
or the things that you cannot see. So what is reality? What is the meaning of my life? Where am I headed? What am I here for? Who made me and why? People say, how can you believe in something you can't see? Faith is a gift. For those who cannot accept faith or understand mystery, there is no explanation. For those who do, they accept it and you can't explain it. Lacrimarum Ballet